God has certainly given us a lot to be thankful for. And when we, I mean, there are times in life when life feels difficult, to be sure, and when we feel depressed or down or we're feeling sorry for ourselves. I've been there, and my, you know, my constant reminder that I have to remind myself of is that God has given me a lot more to be thankful for than He has given me to not be thankful for. And in that respect, the problem ultimately is myself and my lack of gratitude. In fact, I would submit that all sin ultimately has at its heart and soul a lack of gratitude for the gifts that God has given us. Because were we truly thankful for what God has given us, we would not be so quick in our hearts to grasp at something else, something that this world has to offer. We would not be so quick to say, I want more than what God has given me, like Eve in the Garden of Eden. We would not be so quick to say things like, well, you know, I deserve this and I'm going to do this whether anybody else likes it or not. That's ungrateful for the blessings that God has given us. We owe God a lot. And with that in mind, I want to approach the lesson this morning from Luke chapter 17 with this idea. We're asking this question, what do we owe? Actually, really, I have three questions I want to ask this morning. First of all, what do we owe other people? Second of all, what does God owe us? And third of all, what do we owe God? Well, that brings us to Luke chapter 17. And the first 19 verses are where we're going to put our focus this morning. And we'll start with the verse 4 verses. He said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. What do we owe other people? We owe people forgiveness. We owe people our love. And that is just by in, inherent in the fact that we are children of God. Right on the heels of chapter 16 when Jesus has given them so many warnings about grabbing at their stuff and you know, not sharing their possessions with others and making their life consist wholly of possessions, Jesus then points out the fact that stumbling blocks will come. It is inevitable. Who hasn't stumbled at some point in their life? Who hasn't succumbed to some worldly pleasure that the Lord uh, against the will of the Lord in our lives? Those, those stumbling blocks are inevitable. But if you're the cause of it, watch out. If you are the reason that somebody, caught, that somebody walks away from the Lord, if you are the reason that somebody loses their faith, if you are the reason that somebody is unable to repent because you are dangling something over their head and not allowing them to attain forgiveness or forcing them to earn forgiveness in some way, well then, you are the one that is causing stumbling. And no, I'm not talking about just generally offending people. Otherwise, I'm in a whole lot of trouble, I guess, on that point, because I uh, like to offend people all the time. I think the gospel is offensive. For that matter, Jesus is in a lot of trouble, because Jesus said a lot of offensive stuff, didn't he? he? The problem is not offending people. Jesus certainly said a number of things that would be considered bad PR statements. Statements that got people to say, you know, I don't want to follow you anymore, Jesus. That's too difficult. And they walk away. Jesus has said a number of things like that in the Gospel of Luke. Telling people to hate father and mother, uh, or you can't be my disciple. Telling people, you can't even go say goodbye to your father. You put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus says some pretty harsh stuff. And it's offensive. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about stumbling blocks. And uh, I think that, that, that a mistake is sometimes made when people think of stumbling, they think of simply offending somebody. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is actually causing somebody else to sin. Putting a stumbling block before others. If you cause somebody else to sin, it would be better if you just took a big heavy millstone. Uh, well, we don't really use millstones a lot in our culture anymore. If you took a, a big heavy... Well, I don't know, think of something really heavy like your automobile or your SUV. Hang that around your neck and jump into the sea. That's better than causing someone to sin. And what is the main cause of stumbling? It's a failure to forgive other people. Um, now, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18 has a similar statement, and it's a much longer discourse in Matthew 18, ending with the parable of the unforgiving servant. And really, it's a lesson in forgiveness and gratitude, because... You know, there's a man who owes a substantial amount of money, 10,000 talents. That's more money than he'll make in his entire life. 
I don't know how he got into that kind of debt. I mean, I guess when you know the average American is carrying over thousands of credit card debts every month, anything is possible in the ancient world even, but uh, you know, he gets into this outrageous debt and his master forgives him and says, you don't have to pay that debt. I forgive you. And immediately he goes out and he finds somebody that owes him a much smaller debt, a hundred days back pay. And this guy, you know, you, you repay what you owe right now or you're going to prison. Oh no, give me time, give me time, I'll pay back what I owe. No, you're going to prison now. It throws him in prison, unwilling to forgive the lesser debt. And when his, master, his first master finds out, he realizes that, you know, uh-oh. He says, you see the hypocrisy here, don't you? You know, you've ju I just forgave you a debt that was completely unpayable, and you wouldn't turn around and forgive this guy who owed you a much smaller debt. So now you know what's going to happen? You will be cast into the prison until you have paid the last cent. That is, forever. That's what for and so that will be the way God responds to everybody who does not forgive his brother from their heart. Forgiveness is a tricky thing, and it is one of the most difficult commandments given here. Jesus says that if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now this is Luke's version of the statement that Peter asked to Matthew. Now in Matthew, Peter asked the question, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? How many times do I have to do this? What's the bare minimum you're going to make me do, Lord? You know, there's kind of, you know, I, I, how many of us think of forgiveness in those terms, right? I, I only have to forgive him seven times, right? Jesus says, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. In other words, 490. The reason Jesus said that wasn't so that you could get out your checklist and say, all right, you're at time number 489, so I only have to forgive you one more time before I don't ever have to forgive you again. That's not what the point of that statement is. Jesus says forgiveness is not something that you keep score on. It is not something that you keep track of. It is not something that you allow to destroy your relationships because love keeps no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13 says that. And if you are, keep, if you are the sort of person who is keeping score in your life, you're going to have a very hard time in your relationships with other people. It doesn't work that way. Luke goes even more extreme in recording a statement of Jesus. He picks this one. If he sins against you seven times a day, and then comes to you seven times a day saying, I repent, forgive him. Well, 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 wait a second now. Wait a second. That's a little difficult for us. I mean, you know, if somebody sins against me and comes, you know, and repents and says, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I, you know, I generally forgive him the first time. I think most of us would forgive him the first time. And he does the, the same thing in the same day. And he comes to you a second time. Eh, okay, you just did that twice, but I'll forgive you the third. You know, by the third time, by the fourth time, are you getting a little suspicious of this guy? Because I am. By the fifth time, the sixth time, Jesus says seven times a day. What does that mean? You know, do you think this guy's do you think this guy's lying to you by now? Do you think this guy is a phony by now? Do you think this guy is trying to pull one over on you by now? Yeah, probably. You know what? So what? Jesus did not say, okay, now I want you to, after the fifth or sixth time, I want you to start carefully evaluating and playing detective. Jesus didn't say that. He said to forgive. And forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a reflection on the character of the person being forgiven. It is a reflection on your own character. A lack of forgiveness is part of the devil's plan to destroy God's people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 10 and 11, Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Whoever you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. What, Satan has a scheme? Well, yeah, Satan has a scheme, all right. He's a real schemer. What is Satan's scheme? Satan's scheme? You know what his big plan is? You know what his plan is to destroy your life, to ruin your existence, and to make you not a part of the people of God anymore? It's to get you to not forgive people. That's part of Satan's plan. And if you refuse to forgive your brother for something, some, if you're holding some wrong over his head, no matter how serious you think it is, you are failing to forgive him. You are playing right into the devil's hands. You are buying right into his schemes. Do not be ignorant of Satan's schemes. It will not work. Now some people will say, well, well, what if he's not sincere? What if he, he, he's just getting away with something? 
phony repentance. We can't let people get away with that. You know, we tend to... It feels like we, we act like phony repentance is a problem. It's such a big problem that Jesus never mentions it at all, does he? Uh, or the rest of the Bible really doesn't ever talk about it, does it? Now, the Bible does talk about, you know, when you repent, make sure your repentance is sincere. But does it say, you know, we should be so concerned about other people's repentance? Is that our job? Is that ever our job? Is it our job to sit in the throne of God and judge the motives of people's hearts? No. Not at all. Oh, but they're going to get away with it. No, they're not. What, do you think that because you don't enforce somebody's repentance that they're going to get away with stuff? Does God need your help on that front? Does the judge of all the earth not have the ability to tell who's lying and who's telling the truth? Or does he need your help on that front now too? I mean, I think we need to consider that idea. But you know what else? What if on you, you're wrong? What if you and your imperfect judgment, what if I and my imperfect judgment am wrong and I judge somebody to be a phony in their repentance and they're really not and they were really sincere? What have I just done? I have just caused one of these little ones to stumble. What is the worst problem? You know, the best way to take somebody and make them stumble, somebody who's already so spiritually weak, somebody who's all, all so struggling just to, you know, get themselves, get their lives in order and be pleasing to the Lord, and they finally decide to take a step forward and get their act together and say, I repent, and we say, no, I'm not going to accept that until I see some fruits of repentance. That's the best way to shut somebody out right there, to cause somebody to stumble. Let me tell you something. When John said you need to bear fruits, fruits in keeping with repentance, he wasn't telling you personally to go out and enforce everybody else's repentance. He was telling you about the judgment of God and how God will judge people's repentance. It's not your job to do that. It's not my job to do that. It's not anybody's human job to do that. It's our job to forgive. That is what we owe others. God mandates it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So nothing destroys churches faster than a failure to do this right here. Failure to forgive a brother who has already said, I repent. Well, what does God owe us? Nothing. That's what God owes us. Spoiler alert, I was talking, I think I was talking to Craig beforehand, and I asked the question, you know, what does God owe us? He said, that's a good question. And it is a good question. You know what the answer is? Nothing. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. He's given us a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, the disciples in response to Jesus' difficult statement about forgiving, in verse 5 they say to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Why did the disciples ask for the Lord to increase their faith and their trust? Because what he's asking is hard. You think it's hard to forgive people? I do. I like to keep score. I mean, I like to hold grudges. But I can't do that because the Lord tells me not to. And I have to stop that business. Why do the disciples say this? Because what Jesus is commanding is hard. True forgiveness is so difficult from the human perspective. We need to pray to the Lord. I think we ought. this is something we ought to pray. Lord, increase our faith. But Jesus' response to it is essentially... Now shut up and get back to work. <laughs> you want to increase your faith? Shut up and get back to work. Because God doesn't really owe you anything. He tells this parable of the unworthy slaves. And you know what these slaves are? They are hard workers. They go out in the field and they plow the fields and they feed the livestock. And they have such, they're such hard workers. They're worthy of their slave labor. And the master, you know, when they come in from working and the master says to them, Oh guys, here, you know, sit down. Take a load off. Take a break. You've all done such a good job out there today. No. That's not what the master does, is it? He says, you've got more work to do. Uh, unlike chapter 12, where the master comes home and finds his servants waiting, he does not need to reward them. Instead, what does he command them? He says, you've got to feed me. You've got to make my dinner. You've got to set my table. 
And you know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say thank you because he doesn't need to. Because the slave has only done the job for which he was paid. He has only done the job which was expected of him in the first place. And you do not thank someone for doing what merely what is expected of them. And the slaves acknowledge this fact. In verse 10, when you do these things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which ought to have been done. They have not gone above and beyond the call of duty. They have only done what their master has required. So when the disciples ask questions like, okay, what's the bare minimum number of times I have to forgive my brother? There, there isn't a bare minimum. You're missing the point. The kind of attitude that says, bare minimum Christianity. Do you, you, you think you'll be saved if you're a bare minimum Christian? You could take that route. But i got bad news for you. I don't think anyone here meets the bare minimum of God's real criteria. You know, I, I, some people think that it, it, the heaven, getting into heaven is like getting a, a grade on a, in a school class or something. And, you know, as long as I pass with a C, I can get into heaven. Uh-uh. That's, if, if, that, if that's the way, if that's the criteria for getting in, we all fail. We all get F's. And the reason why is because we owe a debt so much greater than none, that none of us can repay. We owe a debt that we are incapable of repaying. You know, these slaves, they, did, they only did the bare minimum and it's not good enough for reward. This is our relationship with God. We are all slaves of God. The Old Testament viewed God's people merely as sojourners and servants in Leviticus 25. And we are incapable of giving God anything that He did not give us first. In 1 Chronicles 29, you know, they gathered all the materials for the building of the tabernacle and they're going to build this great and glorious house for God's name. And you could just be thinking in the back of your mind, oh, that's so great that they're doing this wonderful thing for God. They're building all these things for the temple. But what does their prayer say? Verse 14, David's prayer says, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things have come from you and from your hand we have given you. But we are sojourners before you and tenants as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we provided to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand and all is yours. Since I know, O oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I in the integrity of my heart have willingly offered all these things, so now with joy I have seen your people who are present here making their offerings willingly to you. Let me tell you something about giving to God. You don't give anything to God because God already gave you the stuff you had in the first place. You know? You give something to the Lord's cause or the Lord's people, you are, you are the one that says thank you, not the Lord. Because the Lord is the one that gave it to you in the first place. Even if you were a perfect person, even if you never sinned, even if you kept all of the commandments of the Lord with absolute precision, God would not make a profit on you. You are an unprofitable slave. Even if you could keep the whole law perfectly, I've heard some people say that you, oh, keeping the law perfectly would earn you heaven. No, it wouldn't. Keeping the whole law perfectly would earn you nothing. It wouldn't guarantee anything. It simply means that you did what was expected of you. It doesn't mean that you earned a reward. And I tell you, none of us merits a grade of meets expectations. No one, no one will ever be able to boast before God that, he, that God owes them salvation. Or that they have somehow earned their salvation. Salvation is by grace. Like the thief on the cross whose perspective was, you know, we have merely gotten what we deserve. And it is only when he acknowledges that fact that I have merely got, that we are suffering justly, we get what we deserve, that Jesus tells him, you will be with me this day in paradise. You know, there's no way that that thief earned anything. There's no way that one of us earns our salvation. Another lesson I think we need to learn from this is that Thanksgiving is a one-way street. You know what will happen on the Day of Judgment? How many people will God say thank you to when we get to Judgment Day? None. Not one of us will ever get a thank you from God because He doesn't owe it to us. Because we have not performed a service for Him that He could not do Himself. We are the ones that owe God thankfulness. Hence, third point. What we owe God? Thankfulness. In verses 
11 through 19, we have a story of the ten lepers. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? He said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Let me tell you something about leprosy. And there's a lot of debate about what leprosy actually was. There's a disease that gets called leprosy today that probably wasn't the leprosy of the Bible, uh, but it provides nice graphic images of people's limbs falling off, so that's why preachers tend to use it. Uh, but more, re more in reality, leprosy was a, a symbol of defilement and uncleanness. It contaminated people. It could expelled them from the people of God. They could not participate in the Israelite community life. And Jesus says to these ten guys, go to the priest. And while they're on their way to the priest, they are all of them cleansed. Now the Gospel of Luke is constantly illustrating this contrast between those who are Jews and those who are not. And, you know, we see this in the story of the Good Samaritan, for instance, in chapter 10. Jesus tells a parable, and the only good guy in that parable is the Samaritan, and the bad guys in that parable are all the Jews. That's actually really offensive uh, to the people that he tells that parable to. Well, this story isn't a parable. This story really happens. He cleanses ten lepers, and only one of them comes back to say thanks, and that guy is a foreigner. He's a Samaritan. He is, in the mind of the Jewish people, the least worthy of all to receive this gift. And yet he is the most thankful. He who is forgiven much loves much, but he who is forgiven little loves little, I guess, as we see in Luke chapter 7. Only the Samaritan bothers to thank Jesus. And so here we kind of see the point. Only 10% of the people here need to see the need to thank God. And Jesus tells him, your trust has made you well. And I want to think about that for a second, because, you know, the other guys, Jesus doesn't say that to them. Is it their faith that makes them well? Well, no. I mean, they're healed anyway. You know, and this Samaritan is not literally saved by his own trust. He's saved by Jesus Christ, really. Uh, and the other nine lepers were also cleansed. Even though they didn't have the same kind of trust, even though they didn't really love Jesus, even though they didn't really have the same kind of gratitude, God still blessed them. In the same way that the, ma the majority of the world, all of the world today, is blessed by God. But do they acknowledge Him as God or give Him thanks? No. They do not. What about us? You know, it's the sad thing here. It's the, religious, the most religious people in this story, quote-unquote, who are the most uh, forgetful of thankfulness, we might say. It's they're the ones that take God for granted. They're the ones that ignore His blessings. Is that us? Do we understand our relative worth before God? You know, we don't deserve healing. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve anything, really. From the air that you are breathing in and out of your lungs, you don't even really deserve that. And yet God gives it to you. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike, as he says in Luke chapter 6. When Paul in Romans chapter 1 says that even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. He says that speaking about the Gentiles, but ultimately about all people. And what is really at the heart of humanity's problem? Being thankful to God. That's really what it is. It's our ingratitude that is at the heart of all of our sin. And so the question we need to ask ourselves, and the question we need to ask ourselves every day on a daily basis is, what do I have to be thankful for to God today? And if we were more, I think if we were more dwelling on thankfulness, if we were more dwelling on the things that God has given us, if we actually did what the song suggests and counted our blessings, and realized that the Lord has done so many things for us that we are not even capable of repaying, perhaps we would be more like the Samaritan, and less like the nine who did not return. And perhaps we would be more willing to forgive other people. 
And perhaps we'd gain a greater perspective on who God was and what He really has done for us. Take out your songbooks. God deserves everything. We must give Him all that we can and realize we deserve nothing in return, not even thanks. We deserve nothing. Whatever God gives us should be considered grace, and we ought to thank Him for it profusely. And by the grace of God, Jesus Christ died for our sins, was raised on the third day, and gave us the hope of eternal life. A life beyond this one. I ask you this morning, are you living your life in thankfulness and gratitude to God? Do you have a relationship with the Lord based on trust? Have you been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you submitted to His rule in your life? If there's anyone here this morning that needs to make their life right with the Lord in some way, whether for the first time or whether again in repentance, now would be a good time as any to let that be known. All together we stand and we sing.